Welcome, brave souls, to the chilling depths of horror in detail, the realm where the shadows whisper ancient secrets and nightmares come to life. I am your guide through the darkness, and on this channel, we delve into the spine-chilling world of Wendigo horror stories that will send shivers down your spine. First story. I'm a commentator for a tournament of nightmares. Sometimes it comes down to pure luck. There was little time to look at the body of Zanaya as it was carted off by the cleaner crew, a wave of concern washing over me as they carried his corpse away. Something didn't sit right. Zanaya was a phenom of strength and skill, possessing that otherworldly strength he'd tapped into during his quarterfinal bout. How on earth did he get overpowered here? Who would want to get involved? My mind was ripped from questions as Aljuin put one foot on the balcony barrier and stood like an explorer surveying her kingdom, running a hand through her bleach-blonde undercut hair. Watching Eustace Decolta take his place as the elevator shuddered and the chain bringing it up heaved under the pressure. Eustace kept his hands in his pockets and grinned. Fight fans, we move on with our openweight Grand Prix semifinals and turn our attention to one of the two invitational fighters looking to keep his mystique alive. You know him at the Nightmare Catcher, Eustace Decolta. He bowed in that overly courteous manner and regained his composure as the doors opened and within an instant, that composure gave way to seething hatred. Black hair, long bloodied antlers, a deer skull with small scraps of skin peeling away a hunched-over frame with a descended stomach and wild, ravenous eyes, a wendigo, an old, hungry one. Eustace looked up to Aljuin with a look of shock and betrayal. She shrugged her shoulders. And his opponent, something I think will be most interesting to see, given his fixation on one of our wild-card entrants. The Wendigo of Algonquin Blackwood. It locked eyes with Eustace and began charging, Horrific growling and screeching coming from the beast as Aljuin's smile grew and she threw her hand in the air. Begin. NFC Openweight Grand Prix Semifinals. Eustace Decolta vs. The Wendigo of Algonquin Blackwood. Eustace made no effort to open his satchel, to bring forth a nightmarish creature under his control and end things in a snap. Instead, he threw it aside with his hat and cloak rolling through the legs of the charging Wendigo and rolling up his sleeves as it turned to pounce. My, my, so I am to be made a fool of in this Grand Prix, am I? Oh, Von Trier, you are merely allowing me to show off my skills with the fiery passion of hate. As he enunciated the final word, his right fist volleyed into the stomach of the Wendigo. It winced, but did not stop its trajectory as it bit into the soft flesh of his shoulder, tearing a piece off and leaping to the other side of the pit to feast. A stunning development. Eustace Decolta has so far been the one to win this entire thing, yet he is now on the receiving end of some vicious punishment. Zuck, what do you think will happen? If he doesn't get that satchel soon, he's going to end up sliced, diced, and not looking so nice. Meanwhile, our cannibal boy over there is snacking on that piece of Eustace like it's one of my strombolis. Decolta has got to do something here. The Wendigo stared up at us as we spoke. Fear gripped my bones when I locked eyes and saw the sheer madness driving this creature to feast. I thought about the legends I'd heard of families huddled up during bitter winters, the spirit talking to the men and urging them to give in to their hunger and devour their family. I felt that primal hunger locked onto me and the terror on my skin. So this is how I am to be treated as an invitational fighter? I must reveal why I am here before you now? You could have simply asked Commissioner Aljuin. Eustace's angry shout snapping me out of the trance and looking down at him, and clutching his wound as he stared daggers at Aljuin. He wrapped it with some tape in his pocket, and while circling the still-feasting Wendigo, pulled out a pair of brass knuckles and began approaching. No, literally walking towards this hulking mass of muscle and meat. Was he insane? I loved my family. Growing up, we always enjoyed traveling the circus and plying our trade as the devilish decultus. I was the illusionist in training. My mother was our animal carer and expert, father the fire devourer and weapon specialist with my elder brother being our master of ceremonies. Joseph loved the pageantry of performances. I wanted to be just like him, kind, passionate, 
and beautiful. Eustace took several paces. He was twenty feet away now and stopped to ruminate on his past, the Wendigo finishing his meal and looking up with a melancholy expression, like he'd forgotten he was even in a fight at all. I remember the night it happened. Father said a new attraction was coming to the circus we were contracted to, and he was concerned, mother, and he went to check it out while my brother watched me. I was five, he was thirteen. I remember the blood-curdling screams, my mother rushing to our wagon door with her arm hanging out of its socket, the fucking animal leaping onto her scalp and ripping it off with its teeth, the beating my brother sustained as he lured it away from where he'd hid me. The screams, ripping of flesh and gurgles fading to nothing before the deafening silence fell once more. The Wendigo charged and ran straight into an uppercut from Eustace, brass knuckles firmly attached and sending the beast and some of its teeth flying as it toppled to the ground in a heap. Eustace breathing heavily. This was not a man accustomed to fighting with his fists. That abomination took my family in an instant. I vowed to never let it happen again. I joined the Order of the Moth and dedicated my life to finding, capturing, and where control wasn't possible, eliminating these creatures. He looked down at the Wendigo with disgust as he stepped over it, standing above its head and spitting on it. I have never seen such a thing like Wendy. My interest in her is unique. But she is the prize I have come to claim here. When I got word these creatures were housed here, I sought an invitation and acquired one with my then most recent capture. Here I am, waiting for my moment and now with my eyes on a wish. He leaned down over the still-dazed Wendigo and raised his fist, brass knuckles still attached, into the air as he spoke. A wish to wipe out every abomination, good or evil. He drove it down into the skull of the creature with prejudice. Two strikes, then three, a fourth shattering part of the skull before the creature twitched and fell limp. Eustace, sweating and still bleeding, rose to his feet and walked back to his bag, Aljuin's eyes watching him the whole time. What a come-from-behind victory by the nightmare catcher himself. Zunk, why did he not use his satchel? I knew the answer, but that only made it more disturbing to hear someone else confirm. I'm assuming he didn't think it worthy of being in with his other captives, Sal. I'd guess that he wanted to finish it personally, but uh, well, if he wants to eliminate all of us creatures, that's gonna make it hard to root for him, huh? I nodded, looking back at Eustace and waiting for Aljuin to call the fight. Instead, she was looking past him and to something else lurking in the corner. As he picked up his satchel, he noticed it had fallen open not in time to stop the pincer-like stinger rip into his shoulder and tear it open as the visage of Mr. Stairs crawled up his back, the face twisting around as it cackled. You thought you had me locked up in that bag for eons to come, didn't you? Well, you made a big mistake, pal. If I'm not trapped in there, I've got free reign and I'm in the mood for a new body. How about yours? He screeched with a sick laugh readying himself to burrow into the mouth just like he did at the exhibition match. But Eustace whistled and all other sounds faded away. It was a single note, but it rang through the venue, stupefying us into a silence. As several hands began blindly searching from the satchel, each with the EDK branding on the tops of them, they moved in the same way as a spider, but with a greater sense of agility. Within moments, they sensed Eustace and crawled up his person, grabbing at Mr. Stairs one by one until they completely enveloped him, squeezing his wooden frame. Eustace's whistling grew higher in pitch as they tightened their grip, the wood splintering under the pressure and making the hairs on my body stand on end. When it hit the apex, the doll snapped and with a powerful gust of wind, a smog escaped the doll and floated out of the pit and down the elevator shaft. Eustace's eyes followed it for a moment, and it looked like he was intent to chase after, but he sighed and grabbed at his now pouring wound, grimacing before taking himself to the dugout, satchel dragging on the ground behind him as Algerwin declared him the winner. A damn interesting story, Eustace. I knew this fight would bring out the best in you ahead of the finals. Let's keep this party rumbling and find out who will be joining you in the finals from the wild card bracket. He's in the Nirvana state, 
He's got that pure zen that could snap into violence at any moment. Mr. Game of Death himself, Kuang Shao. The attention moved to the dugout, but nobody emerged. Normally, up to this point at least, the fighter would be standing and waiting when Aljuin called them out. A courtesy, more than anything. Plus, after all he'd gone through to get here, you'd think Kuang would want to be right out there and claiming what he sees as his rightful spot. But two minutes passed and nobody came out, much to Aljuin's chagrin. All right, someone fucking wake up the Monkey King and bring him here. He's had enough time. She slammed a foot down and the ground shook a tad. You two have been on your own journey through hell, Sabata. I looked behind me and Kwong stood here, his eyes white and his jaw slack. Someone was speaking through him. Someone sinister. This one climbed through the Gashidakuro for eons and attained a higher state. He flitters between planes of existence and needed to suffer the most gruesome of fates in order to make the leap. But you, my word, you did it without even trying. He reaches out cold, clammy hands and grips my forearms, zunk looking on nervously and unsure how to act. I have watched you travel between spaces, dip beneath the static, ascend the floors of inertia and fly across the valleys of death. I have seen you live, die, love, suffer and struggle countless times and yet you sit here before me, unable to even comprehend your brilliance or your danger. My eyes burned and I felt the aura of a migraine rising in the back of my skull, like I was dipping my head into hot wax. I felt sick and the more I heard him speak without moving his lips, the more terrified I became. This one has been borrowed to pass a message on to you, Sal Sabata. One that you need to hear even at the cost of this one's safety. Aljuin looked up and began shouting to her security. As Zunk pried Kwong away with ungodly strength, he uttered something that chilled me to the bone, though I couldn't place why. He's already here, waiting to drag you into the void. Be aware. With that, his body seized and his nose bled profusely as he was dragged away. I stood there dumbstruck and feeling like someone just walked over my goddamn grave. Aljuin muttered something about fucking enlightened minds, can't trust, him, before declaring Kwong eliminated due to incapacitation and moving on. But I couldn't shake the inalienable feeling that something was watching me, piercing eyes from somewhere unseen in the venue, and a malicious intent that separated itself from the competitors below. The kind that threatened to take me at a moment's notice whenever it saw fit. Much like Aljuin, the crowd had grown restless and their bloodlust had risen to an all-time high. This was to be expected. Most didn't leave the pit alive, and to forfeit voluntarily or otherwise was absolutely unthinkable. I was trying to calm myself down by scratching my palm when Zunk placed a gentle hand on my shoulder and smiled, staring at the sheets in front of us. Hey, know what I do when I'm nervous? I focus on colors in my mind that made me feel calm. Sounds dumb, I know, but if I get those urges to revert to what I was. Well, I just think of the color magenta and I feel at ease. Sometimes I try to fabricate smells too, the kinds that I can cook in my safe space and bring me joy. Try it sometime, it might help. He smiled and briefly looked over, kind weary eyes meeting mine and putting me at ease as I grinned back and thanked him. Well, what you gonna do, summer duds, happens... Am I right? Moving on to our next semi-final match, though. I don't think we're gonna get any disappointments. Ladies, gents, freaks of all kinds, he's the master of the death clutch and our other invitational fighter for this year's open weight Grand Prix. Ultraviolence, Rex Chuck. Rex emerged from the dugout draped in the flag of his people, the brilliant Netherland colors proudly sporting his shoulders as he completed the walk and imitated a sumo wrestler. Stomping his feet onto the ground before clapping his hands together and staring down the elevator opposite, much to the crowd's amusement. As the doors opened, a familiar foe stepped out for the first time in a while. His mouth still covered in nails and sporting no signs of major brain function, the puppet master stumbled out of the elevator and flopped to the ground, drooling and making no attempt to right himself. He looked exactly the same as when Eustace took Mr. Stairs and put him into the satchel. 
Rex stared at him for a moment and cocked his head before looking over to Alduin. You, uh, you sure about this? I don't want to beat on someone who can't even fight. Ain't that against the rules? Alduin's eyes flashed, and she smiled wide at Rex, leaping up to her perch and laughing. You really shouldn't judge a book by its cover, Rex. Begin. NFC Openweight Grand Prix Semifinals. Rex, Ultraviolence, Chug vs. The Puppet Master. Well, fight fans and freaks of nature were once again greeted with an interesting matchup between the man who made violence a part of his nature and a puppet master who used his nature to inflict violence. That being the case, I'm finding it a bit conflicting to call a match wherein the latter is at the mercy of the former from the get-go. Zuck, what are your thoughts? I looked to him, but he was fixated on the fight with such intensity that his grip on the table was beginning to bend the wood. He looked indignant at the sight. Rex walks forward and rotates his right arm as he does so. Ah, oh, I hate to do this, but I got a reason for being here, buddy. A lot of kids back at the Death Clutch gym need to know how to protect themselves and deal with that anger healthily. I need this W. Ain't nothing personal, I promise. He picked the puppet master up and let loose a brutal combination. Fist to the stomach front kick to the kneecap and a ferocious uppercut to the jaw as he dropped down, doubling the impact and sending him swirling into the air. He wasted no time and caught him with a picture-perfect drop kick to the jaw as the puppet master hurtled back to the ground, the shot careening him into the wall and leaving him in a heap, still drooling. What? Hey, combo. You can slap 4.50 on that bad boy and bill me for the Happy Meal separately. Rex showing us that he lives up to the moniker 24-7 and his students at home must be proud. Though I find it hard to cheer with the opponent limp, it looks like this one will be over soon and Rex Chug will be moving on to the finals. No, he's just biding his time. Zunk breathed, leaning forward to such a degree that he threatened to topple the table, his body quivering with anger. I looked back and the puppet master still looked catatonic as before. His head slumped forward as blood and drool, Rex walking over to pick him up. Man, I really thought you might perk up, but I guess not. I'm sorry, I promised to make this quick. Rex's left hand rose above his head, the fingers twisting into that unusual pose as they gripped the puppet master's chest. At this, the puppet master reared his head up, placing his hands on Rex's chest and opening his mouth, the nails driving further through his flesh as they split and fell out. Gone was the dazed overlook and in its place was a man who knew full well where he was. Made you look, Rex. He hissed. But it feels so. So good to be back in my body. Shame you can't relate, huh? He pushed Rex away and in that moment of separation, punched the air as Rex had done previously. The crowd and myself holding their breath. For a moment nothing happened. The puppet master stood up and wiped his face, holding his stomach. Well, I never expected this to be an easy ride, but man am I lucky this happened when it did. You pack a hell of a punch, Rex. Shame it had to be me you met, but take out one meathead in Zanaya. Take out them all, I suppose. Rex didn't respond. He couldn't. Whatever had infected Zanaya in those closing moments had made its way into him. He stared vacantly at the puppet master as he chuckled and threw out his hands, twitching the fingers and making Rex stretch out his arms and look up. Directly at Alduin. I told you we wanted in, champ. Can you see me now? The shot rang out, and the hole punctured through Rex's chest created a small window for Alduin and the puppet master to see one another clearly. He posed as if framing a photo while Rex stood there gasps of air escaping his lungs before he dropped to his knees, falling face down into the mat. The crowd roared as my lungs burned in my chest at the sight, but before I could even say anything to close out the match, Zunk flipped the table and sent it crashing to the bottom of the pit. He always loved toying with others. If it wasn't small animals, it was locals in the towns we inhabited, unsuspecting passers-by or people he could con. His craving for more got so ambitious, we managed to separate his body from his soul, 
Who'd have thought he'd end up here of all places? Why wasn't I informed? He yelled to Alduin, who snapped her eye to him and glared. Even if he was upset, he clearly made a mistake. Guess the apple didn't fall far from the tree, did it, Jersey Devil? The puppet master quipped, holding up Rex's body and making it agree with him before unceremoniously dropping it and laughing that foul laugh Mr. Stairs let out before. What the hell does he mean, Zunk? I asked, seeing the anger building up in him as he darted his eyes to both sides. That man down there, the one who just manhandled Rex Chuck, he's my son, Malthus. But he goes by another moniker from his terrorizing days. He swallowed, and his fists clenched. The tension in the air was palpable, but I couldn't take my eyes off of Rex or shake the anxiety of this creature's intent. They called him the Black Dog of New Jersey. Second story. It's illegal to use Loveland Road. I know why. As I sat down to write this, I started to wonder how many of you may have passed through Alcon, Nebraska. I can't blame you if you don't remember. I'd wager I can count on two hands the number of visitors that stayed for more than a day in the whole time I've lived here. There's not much to do, or even look at really, with a population of 10,000 tops in two movie theaters, one high school, one McDonald's, and a baker's dozen or so of local restaurants between us. But I've of course always had a bias for the place I grew up, so I'd indignantly defend any snide remarks made about Alcon. The people are nice, there's little crime, and the high school's got a good graduation rate. What's not to like? But now I can't urge all of you enough that if you pass Alcon while on a road trip or something, you need to keep driving. I know that the next town is a good ways away, but please, don't stop in Alcon. But if I can't convince you to tough out a bit more driving, at least listen to this. Don't use Loveland Road. Growing up in a small town has advantages and disadvantages. An advantage is that if someone is in trouble you can bet that a small army of neighbors would be there to help them. A disadvantage is that if someone is trouble, the whole goddamn populace knows about it. And I'm willing to bet that Mr. and Mrs. Samuel experienced the full force of both ends of this spectrum two years ago. Alexandra Samuel, their oldest daughter, went missing after going for a morning bike ride. She was a senior at the time, a grade above me, and I had talked to her once or twice. She was sweet and pretty, always wore dresses and had glasses. You can bet that the whole of Alcon knew by sundown. An incident like that was so alien to our community. Remember when I said there was little crime? Yeah, well the worst thing before Alexandra was the suspected arson of an abandoned barn. Search parties got together. Posters were put up. It was all anyone talked about. There truly was no trace of where Alexandra had disappeared to. Then seemingly all at once the police called off the effort. Information about that case became suspiciously hard to get after that. Which of course only heightened interest. The only word from the police department after that was that the investigation was taken to a state level. Then radio silence. Things didn't change much in Alcon in the following weeks. The Samuels understandably moved shortly after and business bummed along as usual. There was however our town's little unsolved mystery bubbling under the surface. Oh, that, and people weren't allowed to drive on Loveland Road. I was surprised that more people didn't notice any correlation of those two events. Maybe it was just that nobody knew that the second one even happened. Heck, I only knew because my dad had a bad habit of announcing quite literally everything in the newspaper during breakfast every morning. Here it says Alcon Council just ordered Loveland Road closed. Huh. He said more to himself than us, half interested I skimming the paper. I asked my parents if they thought if had anything to do with Alexandra. All I got in response was that annoying parent, I don't know. Act that really meant that they weren't up for thinking that morning. But for some reason, I couldn't let it go. That same day I brought it up to my friends and some of them shared my intrigue. Upon checking the paper for myself later, there was no reason actually listed for why Loveland Road was closed. In the paper itself, that is. As I recount this it's almost eerie how things came together. 
In my English 3 class, we were assigned a project to pick a recent news article or research it at the library. She made it very clear nobody was to do their project on Alexandra. I don't think anyone would have anyway. It was too real, too soon. Either way, I'm sure you can guess which little blurb of an article I chose. When I went to the library the following weekend to request any additional info about Loveland Road being closed, the librarian said that the article I already had was it. A bit taken back, I settled for any other articles in reference to the road. There was only one. Two officers go missing while on manhunt. While in pursuit of Rick Smith, suspected of domestic abuse and assault of a police officer, Officers John Smith and John Jay followed an anonymous tip from a source in Alcon claiming to have seen him at a gas station. Smith and Jay responded to the call at 7.30 p.m. on June 8th, informing their supervisor they were conducting a follow-up. When the officers arrived at the gas station, they spotted the suspect's vehicle fleeing the scene and radioed that they were pursuing and requested backup. The officers and suspect were last seen continuing the chase onto Loveland Road, when shortly after Officer J radioed in that, suspect has exited the vehicle, continuing pursuit on foot. This was the last known contact with either officer. Responders found both J and Smith's unattended cruiser and the suspect's vehicle at the scene. Alcon PD has stated that investigation and searches are ongoing for both the suspect and the officers. If you see this man. Obviously, I replaced the names for anonymity. But the point stands that this only made me more unsettled and curious about Loveland Road. Upon showing the article to my friends, they seemed to share the sentiment. Which is when we decided to give a little visit to the street for ourselves. I know. Stupid. Horrendously stupid. But keep in mind you're reading this in the context of this Nasleep. If you were reading this anywhere else, you'd expect that there was nothing, or at most, it was creepy. We just thought it'd make for an interesting story. So me and three of my friends went to hang out, one Saturday, and learn why it was illegal to use Loveland Road. As we went driving, we noted how distant the road actually was from the rest of Alcon, which is saying something. Long before we reached Loveland, the road turned to gravel, and then to dirt. When we pulled onto the road in Trent's car, he was the only one of us who had his own. Sure enough, there was one of those wooden police barriers blocking the way with a bright orange sign reading, Road Closed. This didn't stop curious teenagers, of course. Little does. We pushed the barrier to the side, a tinge of excitement brewing in me, and we continued on. Getting further and further down the path, we noticed more and more signs indicating we weren't supposed to be there. These two predictably went ignored until we finally stopped and decided to look around. Loveland Road was totally covered on either side by dense woods. But since it was late November, most of the leaves had long fallen off and made everything seem gray and empty. Even though it was still daytime, I could see my breath in the air as I stepped out of the car. I didn't remember it being that chilly when we first left, but then again it was a long drive. We all began picking around, armed with bats, surveying the woods as if we might find something that the police had overlooked. I think we were excited simply by the fact that we weren't supposed to be here, not really expecting to find anything. But we did. After a while we all just started bullshitting around, talking while walking the length of the road, the novelty of the setting having worn off. We'd been out for about an hour, and the sun was beginning to set. And even though we were bullheaded and fairly relaxed, no way were we going to stay on that road at night. We collectively turned around and began making our way back to Trent's car. That's when we heard the screaming. It was faint. Really faint. Call stopped us, though, and made us listen. Somewhere, far away to our left, we could hear a throaty, frantic scream. Every few seconds it would stop, then pick up again at full force. I'd like to think the way we reacted was fairly rational. Trent took off running down the street we began to chase after him when he called back to us. I'm gonna grab my car. You guys go find them. I'm calling the police. The three of us took off towards the screaming, bets in hand. I guess at the time we all thought that there was a chance it could be Alexandra. 
Maybe she had gotten lost and only now got the strength to call for help. Maybe she had escaped from someone who'd taken her. None of us could have guessed the source of that sound. The screaming only got louder and more, gurgly as we got closer, and I could feel myself begin to lose nerve. But Kyle and Mason kept trucking forward, so I did my best to steel myself and keep up. Any semblance of confidence we had was shattered when we turned into a small valley the scream echoed from. First I saw the man. He was bound at the wrist and ankles with this heavy rope. Encompassing the rest of his body was this crude-looking steel cage. The man was struggling against the machine he was trapped in, but every few moments the iron bars shifted, just a little, outwards. It was such a slight change. I actually heard something in him pop from where we were, followed by an anguishing screech. My eyes followed the framework of the machine against my will, along the man, to a crank that was very slowly being turned, to a hand. Then I saw the rest of it. It was tall. Hideously, unnaturally tall. And thin. Its hollow, milky eyes met mine. It looked to be smiling, but the skin was so tight on its face I couldn't tell. Everything about it seemed stretched out. The limbs, the face, all except the clothes, all except a dirty, broken glasses and a tattered dress. We all ran. Never before have I felt such impending terror in my life. My lungs burned and I kept scraping my legs on branches and logs, but never once did we stop. Before my mind registered, I was even on the street we kept on running towards where Trent's car was parked. It had finally begun to get dark. Mason started shouting down the road hoping Trent would hear us and hurry. After five minutes of a full sprint, my body finally trumped my fear. I slowed and crouched for a moment, trying in vain to catch my breath. Mason and Kyle stopped too, both breathing heavily and producing cell phones. The only words I could produce were fucking fuck. As I buried my head as my hands... We all heard the faint moan at once. All of our eyes shooting back at once, we saw it standing in the middle of the street, looking at us. This one was even taller, scarcely covered in torn blue fabric. I pulled myself up and we sprinted straight into the trees in front of us. Knowing we couldn't run much longer, we tried to find a place to hide while Kyle dialed 911. Kyle and Mason both shimmied under a huge fallen log and tried to make room for me. I knew I wouldn't fit, it's fine, I told them. There's a hollow tree here, just fucking hurry and get the cops. And with that I squeezed myself into the tree and clutched my back close to me. I don't know how much time had passed, but it was much too long. The police should have reached us by now. I asked Kyle what 911 said in a hushed whisper, and he said the operator insisted someone was coming and he should stay off his phone. That didn't sound right at all, as most operators insist you stay on the line, but I didn't have long to consider this when I heard the heavy crunching of leaves. The time between steps was great, but each one was considerably closer. I tried to make myself small as possible as I swallowed back tears. Crunch. Silence. Crunch. Silence. Crunch. Silence. I wretched my eyes open and slowly my eyes adjusted to the darkness outside of the rift in the tree. Two milky eyes. A pain smile. Torn blue fabric. The glint of a badge that read, John J. A loud humming, sweeping lights through the trees. I blacked out. Later, I learned that the police sent a helicopter to our location. Later, I learned this was because the road was unstable and prone to sinkholes. Later, I learned that Trent and his car were yet to be found and they suspect that he may have gone off-road and sunken into one. Later, I learned that the story never appeared in the news. I don't know what we saw on Loveland Road that night. I don't know what happened to Trent. And I don't know why Alexandra's story was covered while the police kept a tight lid on what happened to us. But what I do know is this. Why it's illegal to use Loveland Road and why you should keep driving if you happen to pass by Alcon. Because while I was talking to my mom the other day, she told me something that resurfaced this old, horrible memory. Another road closed yesterday. Beaver Creek. Third story. 
Don't go camping in Oklahoma. All right, now this is a story I haven't told in a long time. It happened to me October, six years ago. I've told four or five people since then and none of them believed me. I decided to stop talking about it when someone filed an anonymous tip to my school psychologist. That was four years ago. I've had a lot of time to think about it since then, and I think I'm finally ready to post my story somewhere. It's about a weekend I spent in the Washita National Forest. I had been planning the trip for weeks. Made sure I had the weekend off work, didn't make any plans, all of that. Started buying supplies a week before I went. I was going to go camping in the forest near my town. I had been camping before, when I was a little kid with my parents. But never as an adult, never by myself, and never in this forest. I was so excited. Now, I'm not an idiot. I took all the necessary precautions. I told a few of my friends where I was going, when I was going to be there, and when I'll be back. I told them if I go missing to call the cops and all that. I brought an extra phone battery and enough food and water to last me a fucking week. I even brought along the 9mm that my dad gave me when I turned 18. Never shot the damn thing, but I figured it would at least scare off whatever the hell wanted to mess with me. I'm telling you all of this so you know that I'm not just some dumb kid who decided to he wanted to take a trip to the forest one day and shit his pants cause he saw a bear. No. I knew what I was getting into. I was prepared. Just not for, well, this. Okay, enough backstory. I'll get on with it. I left around 6 in the morning. It's an hour drive from my place, so I was expecting to get there around 7. Ended getting there at 7.30, but I didn't mind. It was a lovely day, not a cloud in the sky, great weather, camping in the cold and rain is miserable, so I was pretty content with my arrival time. I parked my car a ways away from the forest in a little clearing off the side of the road where I knew I would find it. I gathered my things, had a little snack, and headed off toward the forest. The next few hours are kind of boring, so I'll skip over them. All you need to know is that I made my way well into the forest, set up a camp, and started enjoying myself. Cooked myself lunch on the crummy campfire I made around noon. Watched a pair of birds dancing at each other. I even took a few pictures of some deer I saw with my phone. Couldn't get a good shot, but it's at least proof I was there. But something seemed off. You see, forests are normally kinda loud. Not like, a city loud, but there's this constant background noise that is always going on. Rustling in bushes and leaves, birds chirping and animals prancing around. When I first got into the forest that was all well and good. But the later it got, they sounds just started to go away. Not all at once, it took the better part of the day for me to notice. But yeah, the sound slowly went away. Birds stopped chirping, bushes stopped rustling. I stopped seeing animals too. That's what made me notice, at around 4 in the afternoon I realized that I hadn't seen a bird in a while. That unsettled me, truth be told. But I steeled myself and kept enjoying this day. I was feeling kind of lonely. What with the quiet and all, so I called up a friend and chatted with him till sundown. After that I realized it was getting late, so I hung up, ate again, and put out the fire. After a final assessment of my surroundings a look at the wondrous night sky, I crawled into my tent to sleep. I kept the 9mm loaded right next to where I slept. Just in case, you know? Sleeping on the cold ground in the middle of a forest isn't that easy if you aren't used to it, and considering I hadn't done it since I was a child, I was having a little trouble. It was probably, just a rough estimate, two hours after I had lied down that I started hearing something in nature again. Now, if I had heard bushes rustling a few hours earlier, this would have been cause for celebration, but even Bear Grylls would get creeped out if it was the only thing he'd heard all night. So I did what any rational human would have done and clung the 9mm like it was the only thing keeping me from falling off a cliff. There was silence for a few minutes. The only thing I could hear was my own shaky breath. Then, prancing. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. For footsteps in quick succession. No crunching of leaves or snapping of twigs. Just the steady beat. 
Bada da dum. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. It was getting louder, closer to my tent. I tried to peer through the fabric that separated me from nature, but I couldn't make out a silhouette. I clutched the rifle harder, scared as any person would be. I remember being sure that I would be safe though. Even bears will rarely attack camps unprovoked. But that natural human fear, that was overbearing. Making my mind wander and my hands shake. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. Bada da. It stopped. Close to my tent. Just outside of my tent. I could feel its presence near me. It was totally silent. I knew that it couldn't have been a bear. It would be sniffing the tent right now if it were. I doubted that it was a deer. They don't come out at night. Perhaps a wolf? They normally travel in packs, and even if it were a lone wolf, it wouldn't be a threat until I heard growling. But nothing. Just silence. And then it screeched. That's when I knew that that thing wasn't anything I'd seen before. Nothing makes that sort of sound. It was like a cross between some sort of bird and a human. Like the shit you hear in movies that possess people with their heads on backwards make. That's when I let fear take over, in my bladder and in my hands. I fired the gun in its direction, and dear God was that a mistake. It screeched again, and it scratched the tent, tearing through the fabric, leaving a massive gash in the side. That was my first look at it, if you could call it a look. I barely saw a silhouette through the hole in my tent, but I did see its long arm shredding the side of the tent. It was trying to get to me. I fired the rifle again, but I must have missed, because it didn't flinch. That was when the flight reflex took over the fight, and I only wanted to do one thing. Run. I turned around and fiddled with the opening of the tent, trying to keep my eye on the beast attacking me, but also trying to secure my escape as fast as I could. I did it, and dove out of the tent breaking into a full sprint. Behind me I heard the thing still tearing into my tent. I thought that maybe it mistook its enemy, or prey, for the tent, and not me. But that relief didn't last long. I wasn't far from the tent when I heard its rhythmic prancing again. Asterisk bada da dum. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. Asterisk fff. It was faster than me. Gaining on me. If I tried to outrun it, I would surely be caught. Just then, in what was either a moment of survivalist brilliance or suicidal stupidity, I stopped and dove into a thick bush near me. I remembered that many predators in the forest rely on seeing movement more than anything else. So if I could stay still, then it would not see me. That decision saved my life. It ran past me, stopping in the same place where I stopped. I didn't notice before I hid, but that spot is just under an opening in the trees. A pillar of light penetrated the oppressive dark, and, in the moonlight, I could see my assailant. It was pale, made paler by the white of the moon, and hairless. Thin, like it had not eaten in weeks. I want to say it looked humanoid, but comparing that thing to a human is just wrong. Its hunched back protruded out, making it look larger than any human. It stood on all fours in such a way that no human could. Its rear low to the ground, its long legs bent in such a grotesque fashion that it almost resembled a frog, ready to leap. It circled around, silently, searching for me. I thought it was about to give up, but it threw its horrendous back upwards, and its legs straightened and it stood, on two legs, like a person, a deformed, horrific human. And then it, it looked at me. It looked right at me. It saw me. I know it saw me. Nothing looks at you like that without seeing you. I could tell you the color of its damn eyes, and I bet you that it could tell you the color of mine. I clutched the rifle close to my chest. Too scared to use it. Too scared to move. I closed my eyes and waiting for it to pounce and then. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. Bada da dum. I opened my eyes and it was gone. I didn't move for the rest of the night. I fell asleep in that bush, cuddling with the rifle, until finally being awoken by the sounds of birds. Birds. Thank God birds. It was already daylight. The next morning, I wearily stood up, using the rifle as a crutch to support my aching body. Things seemed to be normal. The forest was speaking once again, and birds and deer aplenty were in sight. 
I stumbled back to my camp to find my things mostly as I had left them. My tent was unsalvageable, but I took my backpack, had something to eat, and I left, just like I had planned. The entire trek back, I didn't stop looking around for that thing. I didn't let the gun leave my hands, either. It wasn't until I got to the car that I relaxed, calling my friend to tell him I was heading home. I didn't tell him about what had happened last night. I was still trying to process it myself. Shit, I don't think I understand wholly what had happened until after the car ride home. And that's where the story ends. Six years ago, and I haven't gone camping since. I haven't seen the thing again, nor have I heard of anyone who's seen it. As a whole my life has moved on completely. But I will never forget that thing. I will never forget how it stared at me. And how it just left. It knew I was there, but it left. Why did it do that? I don't think I'll ever get an answer. Fourth story. The Weir's Beach Wendigo. Before June 28, 2019, I was an avid urban explorer. I would always look down back roads for abandoned houses and soon-to-be-torn-down barns. I'm also a photographer by trade, so naturally, I brought my camera along with me to capture the experience. So when my grandfather invited me up to his summer lake home in the White Mountains, I was gleeful. Not because of the mountain scenery, or the private lake with multiple jet skis, no, no, no. I was giddy at the thought of being able to explore one of my most sought-after abandoned destinations, Surf Coaster. Surf Coaster was a massive abandoned water park about two miles from Weir's Beach. The park covered about 10 square miles and was rumored to be the urban explorer's paradise. I arrived at the nearest public parking lot, a Cumberland Farms, at around 6.40 p.m. I used my phone to see a topographical satellite view of the large abandoned parking lot of the water park. I was led down a few side streets and back roads until I saw the sign. Hidden among vines and bushes was a blue sign with yellow tinted bulb lights surrounding it that said Surf Coaster. Next to it was a rusted and rather puny two-foot high gate with a faded, no trespassing sign. I'll pretend I didn't see that. Stepping over the obstacle, I was presented with a parking lot with a few scattered 80s looking hatchbacks and sedans. They were rusted with their windows smashed in and graffiti plastered all over them. The parking lot stretched about 70 feet in front of me and then stopped to another fence. To my right there was a wooden fence, and to my left down a step hill was an urban explorer's dream. Water slides covered with ivy and moss, pools filled with deflated inflatable toys, and sunning chairs with towels still on them. As I started down the embankment, I stopped at what must have been the ticketing booth. Inside the ajar door was a small room consisting of a chair with a comb on it, an open cash drawer underneath the counter, and a roll of tickets behind the chair. As I stepped inside, I noticed something in the open cash drawer. It was money. Water damaged money. I gentle picked up a 50 and held it up to the golden hour sunlight to see the blue security strip running down the bill. It was real. Why in the world would the company leave money at their closed park? I thought to myself. Placing the bill back in the drawer, I continued down the hill. The next two hours were fairly standard for urban exploring. Chipping paint, dirty water, rotting wood, all except for one small detail. The towels. On most of the lounge chairs by the large pool were people's towels. As if they had just left them. I thought nothing of it and ignored it. After I had seen the last enormous moss-covered water slide, I only had one more place to go. The bathrooms. Now at this point in my adventure, the sun had already set, and a cool breeze was making the hairs on my arms stand up. As I traversed the crumbling pool deck to the hillside bathrooms, I noticed something odd. The bathroom doors. The doors were rusted steel with large locks on them. When I got there, I was right. Large rusted locks were holding the bathroom doors shut. But why the bathrooms? I wanted to explore them, but they were built into the hillside and were mostly underground, so there was only one entrance. As I looked around for a rock or some heavy object to try and dislodge the locks, I realized that the grounds surrounding the bathrooms were scattered with bullet shells. They were still shiny, and using my scarce weapon knowledge they looked to be 30 caliber rounds. 
My stomach turned as the park could actually be closed due to an active shooter or terrorist. Wouldn't that have been on the news? I mean, that's a big deal. I settled myself as they could have just as easily been rounds fired by some rednecks who used the water park as their gun range. It was New Hampshire after all. I soon found a rusted fire extinguisher and successfully knocked the men's room lock off. Inside was an assortment of more towels, swim goggles, duffel bags, and dried up sunscreen bottles. The whole room smelled like vinyl for some reason, and I could barely snap a few picks before bolting out of there. Odd that they would lock that up, but it could serve as a home for homeless people or drug dealers. I was just going to skip the women's room assuming it would be more of the same. But then the thought hit me, what if it was something else? What if it was the same? I had to know. After retrieving the fire extinguisher from the bush I threw it into, I knocked off the second lock and opened the heavy door. A blast of air hit me. There were two things wrong with that air. One was the fact that it made me as cold as I had ever been, and that it smelled like a rotting animal. I stepped out of the way to let myself warm up for a few seconds. I saw a good photo opportunity there with both doors open, so I took it. Setting my shutter speed to capture the light just right, I was about to take the photo when through the viewfinder I saw something that made my blood curdle, movement from inside. There was a grayish-brownish movement coming from inside. I dropped my camera in frozen fear. The faint lighting the full moon gave was enough to reveal the creature that slowly emerged in front of me. It was crouched down to fit inside the doorway, so I could only guess it was nine feet tall. Its face was that of a wolf, and it had teeth that jutted out of its lips. Large green deer antlers topped its head, and its fur was greasy and slimy, like that of a dog's saliva, and as started at it it let out the most terrifying sound I have ever heard. Its wail was high-pitched and raspy at the same time. Adrenaline rushed through me as I turned to run back up the cracking stairs to the hill. My feet pounded on the moist soil as I neared the parking lot. I glanced over my shoulder and only then could I see the complete mass of the creature. It had to be at least 10 feet tall and its strides on all fours told me I had to run faster than I had ever run before if I wanted to live. So I did. I ran all the way back to the main road and all the way to the gas station all while listening to its ear-piercing wails grow farther away. I practically dived in my car and nearly stalled it trying to peel out. I drove the two-hour journey back to Lincoln with my foot to the floor most of the ways. Even though I'm back in civilization, I still don't feel safe, and I regret going there. I also regret dropping my camera. So if anyone wants a Canon 1DX, check the abandoned bathrooms at Surf Coaster, but beware of the Weir's Beach Wendigo. Fifth Story The Wendigo became my friend. I visited my parents' cabin by the lake months ago. It's not something I like to talk about. I lost some friends up there, gained one very important friend. A mentor, you could say. And I had every intention of having a fun, carefree trip. Fuck. I guess in some ways I did. So many memories in such a short period of time too. The sweet smells of people I never noticed before. You go by most people and what do you smell? Some bullshit old spice or axe spray of some loser trying to pick up a girl. But humans are so much more than these modern smells. They can smell like pine trees, fear and hatred, confusion and complete terror. There's a whole universe of sweet smells out there that most people miss. I didn't discover this until my trip to the lake. For the first day, everything went like I expected my girlfriend and a couple of friends were having fun hiking and camping out. We were all having a blast until the rainstorm hit. I've never seen so much rain in my life. It came down in sheets and we barely made it back to the cabin. Kevin tripped and fell. Bobby yelped and said he wanted to go home. My girlfriend made it back to the cabin first. She held the door open for everyone else. Once inside, we made sure all the windows were locked to prevent water from coming in. Trouble was, the roof started to leak. We lit candles because there was no electricity. Fuck, Kevin said. We're all going to drown. Calm down, Kevin, my girlfriend replied. It will take months for the cabin to fill up at this rate. We're going to be fine. 
Kevin was completely right, except water wouldn't be his demise. Bobby didn't say much. He looked like a scared child in his corner, and he leaned forward on a rickety chair, biting his nails. We were all lost in our own thoughts. Especially me, I think. I was having thoughts I had never experienced before. Thoughts of devouring. Of devouring everyone in the room in a rush of blood and destruction of the flesh. I even started to look at my girlfriend that way, which worried me. They were all trapped here, my girlfriend, Bobby, and Kevin. The rain was coming down even harder, and this little group had nowhere to go. They were completely at my mercy, and I couldn't be happier about this fact. Of course, one had to be strategic. I told them I was tired from the ride up here. I got up, kissed my girlfriend on the cheek, and went in my room. It was the largest in the cabin, and I had it all to myself. As I lay in bed, I felt something deliciously dark take over. I knew without having to confirm with some meaningless scientific instrument the Wendigo inhabited the room along with me. Hello, Jason. How are you feeling today? The Wendigo asked. Its voice was gravelly, a little off kilter. Okay. I responded. A little down. Could it be that you have a craving for flesh? I thought about his question. Like, really thought about it. Some philosophers considered suicide to be the greatest philosophical question, but I disagreed. The human action most on my mind was whether or not to rend flesh from bone. The horned thing stared at me from across the room with piercing hollow eye sockets. I felt a feeling which seemed so lush and dangerous that I knew it wasn't good for me. I knew civilization was a sham, an abyss of houses, roads, and stop signs layered with bureaucracy and hazy ambitions to reach its peak. Illusions. I'm glad you've come to see the light, the Wendigo said. I stood up, joints stiff, head swimming, but not in a bad way, in a pleasant I'm drunk and shouldn't be driving sort of way. What happened next I don't really like to talk about. It felt good though. I killed Kevin out back with an axe he used for chopping wood. And Bobby? Death by kitchen knife. I ate them both. I picked their bones clean, leaving them so bare and white you could put them on display in a museum. My girlfriend looked at me with such unbelievable horror that I knew I couldn't devour her like I did Kevin and Bobby. I ran away, into the woods. I've killed and devoured so many things in the wilderness that I've lost count. After the cabin massacre, I lived in a cave in the woods for a couple of weeks, maybe a month. The Wendigo would visit me, tell me tales of days long gone. I'd stare into its hollow eyes, get a fuzzy feeling, and I'd have to go on the hunt again. So for a while, the Wendigo became my friend. I was sad and deflated when it was all over. I'm back in the abyss of houses again, trying to think of an ambition that would excite me as much as what I did in the woods that day. Nothing yet. There's not even the thrill of getting caught. I know the Wendigo will protect me, erase any evidence of my dirty deeds. I have faith in that. I've told you about my first trip to the cabin, where I saw the Wendigo and he showed me the light. Its hollowed eyes gave me a glimpse of a world with infinite possibilities. I'll always remember that day. Absolutely beautiful. My second trip was memorable too, but in a different way. I went up there with three friends I made recently. None of them knew each other, and if they were acquaintances before I met them, I was unaware about it. The Wendigo gave me a certain charisma. It granted me preternatural insights into what made people tick. Didn't matter if they were popular or not. He taught me that despite social position, everyone had their flaws, things that made them human. Their pasts often scared them, and they spent their whole lives running from harmful memories. Or, in some weird cases, wallowing in them. Callie was the strong one, reminding me of my girlfriend, who I didn't want to see during my cannibalistic fever. She kept texting, but I just couldn't bring myself to expose my true nature to her. I know what you're thinking, the look of terror in her eyes, but that's not the same. People only see your true nature when you're gnawing on one of their limbs. Dylan and Marcy were the weak, blind sheep, steeped in the land of crushes and insta-gratification memes. Dylan liked her, but tried to be smooth by ignoring her. She interpreted this as him having an interesting personality. 
Dylan drove, so at least I didn't have to listen to him speak or interact with him very much. Callie kept looking over at me. I think it was because of how mysterious the Wendigo made me seem. I had centuries of interesting stories on my side. I seemed dark, dangerous, and brooding because I was those things. I thought I saw the Wendigo at various points as the wilderness went rolling by. He looked horned and wise, evil yet calm. His wasn't the kind of thoughtless evil you often encountered in horror books and movies. It was ponderous, almost ethereal. You didn't know quite what to make of it. I sighed in a near ecstasy, but it came out mellow. We got to the cabin, all sweaty and feeling tired. Well, except me. I thrived off of their lethargy and discomfort. Callie looked at me. Well, we're here, she said. Maybe we should, um, find a place to rest. It was such a clumsy attempt at flirting that I had to stifle a chuckle. Yeah, we should rest, Dylan said, glancing over at Marcy. He wanted her so bad. I could tell. Same for her. And, oddly enough, I started to feel uncomfortable, inhabiting their lust at the same time as I comprehended it. I saw theirs, but they didn't see mine. Funny how that worked. The afternoon went by, hot and sticky. Dylan and Marcy hid in their room for most of it. Callie tried to snuggle up to me, but I kept distancing myself. I still had a girlfriend. Me being a cannibal didn't change that fact. As night came, we all lit candles. Dylan poked his head out, clearly drunk, and asked for some matches. I gave him some. Now it's just you and me, Callie said, that gleam in her eye. I clenched my jaw. I could hear the crickets chirp, the raccoons scurrying about, coyotes howling. We were in the middle of nowhere, and my heart quickened, though not for the typical human reasons. I said I would go make us a snack. We had a huge kitchen facing the beautiful wilderness, so why not? It sounded like something a human being would say. The real reason? I needed a kitchen knife. If I didn't make Callie's death quick, Dylan and Marcy might come out. They might overpower me. Dylan was a beefcake and might charge at me and break my rib cage if threatened. I went back into the living room with my best charismatic smile. I felt a little ghoulish, but I saw the Wendigo behind her, sitting in one of the chairs next to the small table that faced the window. I heard the light pounding of a gong. It sounded far off, got closer, then faded again. If nothing else, the Wendigo taught me to be sneaky, to prioritize stealth above all. I told Callie the window might be pretty, just like her. She nodded eagerly, turned her back to walk over. Then I stabbed her in the back. Devouring her took minutes. I placed her clean bones in the storage and storage chest in the hallway. I needed to take a shower. A bloody looking me would raise suspicion before I lifted the veil. Twenty minutes later, I knocked outside Dylan and Marcy's door. Dylan answered, clearly pissed off. Hey bud, you do know I'm busy here, right? Yeah, sorry, man. Raccoon just got in. You want rabies? Dylan scoffed and closed the door. But a minute later, he reappeared, wearing a red shirt. Let's get this over with, Dylan said. He pushed past me and into the kitchen. I said I saw it in that general area. After a minute, he shook his head. I pointed to the screened in porch. He opened the door and cautiously stepped through. I don't see any D, he began to say, but his phone bust. He looked down at it with a smile. The same smile he had on his face when he opened the door, and I knew him and Marcy were doing the thing that most humans craved. I took the kitchen knife, clean as a whistle, and plunged it into Dylan's back. He yelped and fell face first into a wicker love seat. Suddenly, I felt less lonely. The Wendigo stood there, nodding in approval. It occurred to me then that I might be more than just a cannibal. An Avenger, maybe. Dylan was devoured as an afterthought. He was tough and tasted like coconut chutney. That left Marcy. I knew she liked to read. Maybe I'd catch her engrossed in a book, utterly witless. Didn't matter, really. I just pondered the little surprises my life offered. It was sad in some ways, exhilarating in others. I did devour Marcy. She was mild-mannered, bleary-eyed, and confused me for the man I just killed. 
I gave her a polite hello, and that was that. I won't tell you quite how I ended her life. Her death seemed more innocent than the others. I can't put my finger on it. Afterwards, I gathered all their bones and rolled them up with the large carpet covering the living room floor. I dragged it through the woods, feeling elated and dreamy. I felt so awash in apathy before coming up here again. Now I felt completely amazing. So worth it. I wanted the cave I visited on my first trip up here, for nostalgia's sake. At the moment, I had no idea why I was dragging the bones with me. My joints ached, but I enjoyed every second of it. The cave was as I had left it, scattered with animal bones. Hello, old friend, I said. Old friend, it echoed in my voice. The Wendigo sat on the largest pile of animals' bones and nodded. He extended his arm and pointed a finger near the ground. I placed the carpet stuffed with bones where he pointed and bowed. For the second time during this trip, I felt my turn toward cannibalism had been for a reason. The Wendigo looked at me with those strangely wise eyes. It knew things I didn't, despite the bizarre experiences I had recently. The season of the cannibal never ends, it said. So I made the cave my home again, thinking about things, broadening my philosophy. I thought about how similar this was to the last trip. Three victims, going out to the cave and meeting the Wendigo, thinking about philosophy. But things had been different. I seemed to be connecting more deeply with people, seeing what made them tick, knowing them without having to know them. I felt like I had a purpose this time around and that I would never take that notion for granted. Thanks a lot for watching the video till the end. Subscribe to our channel Horror in Detail. Drop your opinions slash suggestions in the comments section, and like the video as it helps with the YouTube algorithm.